Good. I'm very pleased to announce our, our final speaker uh, for today, uh, Professor Ted Sargent. Uh, Ted is a university professor in the Edward S. Rogers Senior Department of Electrical, Cam Electrical and Computer Engineering at the University of Toronto, where he holds the Canada Research Chair in Nanotechnology. He also serves as Vice President of Research for the University. He received his bachelor's degree in engineering uh, of physics from Queen's University and a PhD in electrical and computer engineering at the University of Toronto. He's been a faculty member there uh, at Toronto uh, since 1998. He spent sabbaticals as a visiting professor at MIT, UCLA, Berkeley, and Harvard. It's a pleasure to have him today. Um, I can all once again hear you uh, clapping and welcoming him, uh, welcoming him and I'll, I'll hand it over to him. Ted. Thanks, Nathan. I'm just going to put my slides up while I wait for the applause to die down so people can actually hear me. Nathan, are you seeing a first slide? Absolutely. Clear as that. Thank you. Fantastic. Well, it's great to be back at Northwestern. Thanks so much for uh, inviting me. And I've been really looking forward to saying a few words about what we're up to in my group and also having the discussion with this esteemed crowd. So as Nathan was saying, I'm going to talk a bit about using nanomaterials to build molecules. And in particular, I'm focused on electrosynthesis of fuels and feedstocks from CO2. And the source of energy is renewable. So we call these renewable fuels, fuels and feedstocks. So the big picture motivation comes from climate change. And uh, I did have some graphs and some statistics and some PPM of CO2 in the atmosphere, but I think that this picture uh, really captured the, um, the issues a little bit more personally for all of us. We're, we're really all interested in stewardship of the gift uh, of, of the world that we live on, the earth, the planet. And so we need to see how we can play our role. And I think there's a huge role to be played by materials chemists and by nanotechnologists. Um, one of the major sources, and I'll go into more detail, but one of the major sources of emission of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere comes from our energy habits. And just to give you a sense of what 18 terawatt years looks like, um, you can see a few of those examples on the right. In fact, those examples are mostly electrical, and in general, the electricity grid in parts of the world is starting to green, but uh, not all energy use is electrical. This graph gives a bit of a sense of some of the different ways in which we utilize energy. And uh, the stuff in the kind of southeast part uh, of it is the electrical habits. And you saw some of those kind of residential habits on the previous slide. But you'll see that, in fact, um, stuff in the northwest, which is more than half, includes transportation, but also industrial applications and commercial applications. And you can find things here. Uh, that are fairly difficult to electrify. So let's take, for example, light duty vehicles where uh, so far it is still substantially uh, non-electrical. Um, in fact, you can't even yet really see the role of electricity, even though of course, Teslas and other electric vehicles are very prominent in our imaginations. Um, and they do have significant potential to impact this half of the transportation sector, the light duty vehicles. It's a fairly widely held view that the other half here is gonna to continue to need to benefit from the very high energy density and portability and the light engines uh, that are uh, available uh, through, through internal combustion or potentially fuel cells, but that the benefits of liquid carbon-based fuels are considerable in this top half or third of the transportation side. So that's an example of something where using carbon-based fuels uh, it's probably not going to go away fast and where it's very interesting to think about whether we could close the fuel loop, close the carbon loop by consuming CO2 uh, as we synthesize those fuels. Another really big chunky item you'll see here in this sort of pink and red is the chemical sector, which is going into the material science sector, where of course the carbon footprint is very significant. Uh, if we could figure out how to synthesize the chemical precursors for this sector from CO2 and from renewable electricity, we could make a major impact on a major industrial source. There's a lot of potential here, but it's a big challenge and a big problem. Now, on the other hand, there's also some good news on that front, which is there's a big source of energy out there. Uh, you can try in various ways to compare the amount of renewable energy, and I'll focus on solar. It's a big one. Uh, the amount of renewable energy compared with the total reserves of fossil fuels on the earth. 
And so these cubes, the purple one, uh, the, the gray black one, are uh, through their volume representing the total, this is kind of integrated over all time, the total proven reserves of these various fossil fuel sources. World energy consumption, so that was the 18 terawatt years from a few slides back, is this uh, smaller red cube. Uh, the big yellow cube is the energy from the sun, but that's not integrated over all time, that's every year. So there's this vast excess of solar energy that's being brought to the surface of the planet every year. Very good news. Uh, and so you know, what, what prevents us from making better use of that? The first thing has been cost until recently. Solar cells were sufficiently expensive to make and to install uh, that it was more cost effective to get our electricity directly from these fossil sources. Uh, however, that sector has made huge strides and the price of solar electricity has gone down at an amazing rate. The vertical axis here is logarithmic as is the horizontal axis. This is a learning curve and um, approximate grid parity is this uh, red line. In fact, in many jurisdictions, we've reached grid parity. You know from when you're paying your electricity bills that five or 10 cents per kilowatt hour to your home would be a great price. So seeing wholesale production uh, of uh, electricity for the grid at uh, between one and two cents from solar uh, is really spectacular. Now it's happening in this example, an example in one of the best insulated, so you know, most sunlight parts of the world. This is a picture from Abu Dhabi. And so the opportunity, there's still considerable opportunity in solar to make further progress in materials and devices to increase efficiencies and to reduce the cost of solar electricity and to make more and more parts of the globe uh, ones in which its uh, grid parity has been accomplished. So we're by no means done. Uh, and in fact, you can see here, these are some USDOE figures. If, if we continue to advance in reducing the price of solar electricity, this one shows how much percent of US electricity could well be utilized if we could reach six cents and three cents you can see that there's still a lot of uh, elasticity in that curve. So when we further reduce electricity costs from solar, there will be big impacts. Now this one's interesting up here, the orange curve. This is showing that if we can deal with the storage problem as well, and that's gonna link to my CO2 reduction to fuels and feedstocks, then we can get even greater is significant. And actually this is quite a high slope here, penetration uh, of renewables uh, into our industrial systems. So I want to dive into why that's important. What is it about storage of solar that is an enabler of solar? Well, this addresses the problem of renewables intermittency. Solar is a very easy one to think about. A wind has some of the same qualities, which is to say that our demand has peaks in the earlyish morning and into the evening, and is a little quiet during the middle of the day. Uh, but solar's peak is in the middle of the day. So there's a misalignment in time. Uh, now you can think of other timescales on which this is also the case. Uh, a cloud goes over and we don't instantaneously need less electricity. So there's this very short time scale, but especially for those of us uh, a little ways north, like in Evanston and in Toronto and in, in Pittsburgh, um, there's also the seasonal time scale issue. And on the seasonal time scale, we have significant electricity demand uh, in the winter and also in the summer. Um, but especially in the case of that winter demand, which is quite significant, uh, our supply is considerably reduced since we're in the northern bits of the northern hemisphere. Uh, and so there's actually a very large scale storage problem. This involves moving energy not around by a few hours or overnight. There's also the challenge of moving it around over a season. Um, so that many people believe is a challenge for fuels. And to just make this point one last time, and then, then I'll kind of dive into the science of what we're trying to do about it. I'll, I'll just quote from a Nature Energy paper from the last couple of years, which says that without storage, solar is purely a price taker, which just means uh, the seller of solar electricity will have to accept whatever instantaneous price the market is willing to give. And there will be, without storage, there will be more and more times of day as solar penetration is increased where it will have to take whatever that spot price is and it will be a low price. And so the consequence is that without storage, that with increased solar penetration, at the moment we're only at a couple of percent, but as we try to go to 10, 20, 30%, the average value of electricity from solar will diminish. So that problem is addressed with uh, energy storage because then we can move our energy around in time and we can take the price 
that uh, the market's willing to pay at different times of day or in different seasons when it's in greater demand. So it's better for building an economically sustainable sector. And the storage approach that our group focuses on that I'm gonna be talking about today is <clears throat> in taking renewables, and we also need some uh, water. So renewables providing the uh, energy, really the reductive potential. CO2 that we envision being from an industrial plant um, flue gas capture. So the concentration of CO2 coming out of an industrial flue, today it's at five or 10 or 15%, concentrating that up to a fairly pure form of CO2. Uh, and then in the technology I'll talk about today, the electrolyzer or the CO2 reduction system, either reducing that into a chemical, often for the material science industry or into a fuel, uh, and uh, then potentially using uh, that fuel in transportation or in other applications uh, is what we're particularly focused on. So this is an electrochemical reduction reaction. It's got uh, a CO2 electrolyzer and uh, much of the magic occurs right at the heterogeneous catalyst where uh, the reductive potential, the electron, the catalyst material itself, uh, and then the various ingredients, including the CO2 and multiple intermediates along this reduction reaction all meet up. That's where a lot, of the, a lot of the magic is. And typically we're trying to do it around room temperature and atmospheric pressure in order to keep the infrastructure costs under control and in order to keep the system scalable. Now, in order to enable the economics of this, it's worth thinking a bit about where we wanna go first. What would be our market entry strategy? Um, we could start with something like methane. Methane, of course, has a very low existing market price due to the fracking revolution. There's an abundance of methane. The price per ton is, is a couple hundred dollars in the market today. And uh, our estimates, uh, based on these uh, assumptions, and I'm going to dive in on these assumptions in a minute, is that it would be hard, at least at the moment, for us to produce methane from CO2 uh, at less than the market price. In fact, this is showing an estimate of considerably more. But that situation is reversed for ethylene. <clears throat> and ethylene is a very large uh, industry with a very large CO2 footprint. So ethylene is pretty interesting. The propanol looks even more interesting. Indeed, it is even more interesting. You can see that the uh, potential techno-economic benefits of the gross margin available is significant. It is a big market, um, but it's a less advanced technology. The efficiency with which we're doing CO2 reduction to propanol is lower than with ethylene. So it might be a little further out. Uh, ethylene and then actually ethylene glycol are both, uh, sorry, ethanol and ethylene glycol are both quite interesting. And I will, towards the end of my talk, uh, especially if I talk a little faster, say a bit about some very recent ethylene glycol work. So those targets on the previous slide, I didn't talk about them there, but I'll talk about them here. They involve achieving multiple parameters simultaneously. One of the key ones is the Faraday efficiency. We would like, ideally, every single electron, every little piece of reductive capacity that we insert to go towards the production of a single desired product, ethylene if that's what we're making, or ethanol if that's what we're making. So this is selectivity, it's specificity. And typically, we will be competing with less valuable undesired products like hydrogen or carbon monoxide. I mean, th there are markets for those, for those products, um, but typically the market will pay less for them. And if we have a whole cocktail, we will end up spending lots of our money on the separation uh, of those products. Um, we want to achieve intensity. So this is represented through partial current density. And the basic guideline that we know from the water splitting electrolyzer world labeled here PEM is that we'd like to get to an amp per square meter of intensity uh, for, sorry, for square centimeter of intensity. And then when we get to that level of intensity, the infrastructure cost starts to become acceptable. It doesn't dominate the total cost of the products. Uh, on the energy efficiency front, this is where we have a long ways to go. And this is where a lot of the focus of the field is. Uh, how do we ensure that not just 20% of the watts or joules of energy we put in uh, end up reflected in the chemical value of the products, but how do we get to 60 to 80% the way the water splitting electrolyzers that are making hydrogen have already done? So you'll see lots of growth potential in here. And the other thing, we're kind of in the early days here, there will for sure have to be a very significant effort around lifetime, probably an effort that will be expended a little bit more once we meet some of the energy efficiency targets. 
Well, how does this all connect to nanomaterials? Nanomaterials provide an incredible degree of dexterity in the control over things like binding sites, potentially with complex nanomaterials, multiple different binding sites for multiple different intermediates along a chemical reaction pathway. Uh, nanostructuring also increases the effective surface area of materials, and that's now a very widely employed strategy in trying to get the overall uh, geometric activity of materials up. And I would say more broadly, because I, you'll see here, we've got some models of how electrocatalysts work, but I don't think we're done by any means. Uh, they just, nanomaterials provide degrees of freedom, you know, multi-component alloys, surfaces, phase aggregated or not, you know, very well dispersed, atomically dispersed, single atom catalysts, a remarkable range of degrees of freedom that can be explored as we seek to find our way towards building better catalysts. So that's where I'm going to kind of dive into the, the scientific substance and some of the engineering stories of the work. I'm going to tell these four stories of um, some of the work that we've done. In fact, I think it's all from this year uh, on trying to increase the selectivity, the energy efficiency, uh, and the activity of these electrocatalysts for CO2 reduction. The first one's actually gonna be a story of utilizing machine learning to try to accelerate our progress. And first, I just need to say a bit more about the system in which these operate. And I'll be able to then talk about the catalysts and the use of machine learning to find the catalysts faster. So uh, the system, and this, this is something we reported a couple of years ago that's very quite like, widely used now by us and by other groups is a flow cell. Uh, a lot of the pioneering discovery of electrocatalysts had been done in H cells, so in aqueous solutions. Uh, but the challenge with that, of course, is that CO2 is not very soluble. And so uh, we don't get a lot of productivity. We don't get a lot of uh, current density inside those systems. And they don't offer a pathway because of the mass transport limits of CO2 at these low concentrations. They don't really offer a pathway to the kinds of activities that we need. Uh, and so uh, our group and many other groups have switched over to flow cells. In essence, in the flow cell, CO2 is being introduced in the gas phase. In this picture, it's through the bottom. There's a microporous gas diffusion electrode that functions as a support and that lets the gas penetrate. There's the ever important catalyst. And a lot of what I talk about today will have carbon, uh, sorry, will have copper as uh, a major component of the catalyst. Uh, copper is proven to be uh, typically the best catalyst for producing multi-carbon like C2 products like ethylene and ethanol. I'll talk about some ways in which we've been trying to improve on that further by mixing in other elements. Uh, but copper's, copper's really been the, the platform technology. And in this work uh, from a couple of years ago, we were actually trying to figure out how to make a robust and reasonably long-lived, you'll see an operating time of about 150 hours here, a robust and reasonably long-lived system to study uh, these CO2 reduction strategies in a flow cell uh, environment. And what you'll see is that uh, when we were just operating with copper on carbon, we found that within an hour or so, we could uh, have water start to flood into the system. And we lost this gas solid liquid interface. When water's flooding through, that interface uh, moves and you essentially lose your ability to co-locate your catalyst with your uh, gas reagent, your CO2, and, and of course also need the water there. Uh, but when we developed uh, a new approach that was utilizing a very uh, hydrophobic support, so a uh, PTFE support, as shown over here in the SEM, we were able to maintain operation for, at the time it was, you know, uh, one to 200 hours. And as a result, it, it was kind of an enabler of studying over uh, timescales that we thought were a little more interesting from an applied perspective. Uh, the performance of the catalyst as well, because now we could witness how the catalyst was doing, including if the catalyst was changing, rather than just be perplexed by flooding. Um, so one example of an area uh, that we got into was in trying to explore copper plus. So a binary alloy, for example, between copper and another element. Um, and I'll just uh, uh, pay my respects at this point to a terrific uh, Northwestern PhD grad, uh, Mike Ross, who's now a, uh, a faculty member. Mike uh, was with um, uh, the uh, Northwestern team uh, of George and, and Chad and developed deep, deep expertise, of course, in nanomaterial synthesis. And then also that enabled 
uh, binary nanomaterial synthesis. And so working with Mike through collaboration with Pedong, uh, we were able to develop some of our early ideas of how to build binary metal-based uh, catalysts. Um, so some of these uh, materials that are shown in here are really inspired off the kind of work that we were able to uh, start out with Mike and Pei Dong, and it is quite a recent re result. And I'll just highlight one person in particular. You see this uh, Ulisi. Uh, this is Zach Ulisi, who's at CMU, so in, in uh, Jillstown. And uh, this is some work, as I mentioned, about machine learning. And uh, Zach is a real expert when it comes to both computational catalysis and accelerating with machine learning. So this is very much a collaboration with the Carnegie Mellon Group. So what these plots are showing uh, are some studies of how you're going to try to take these uh, mixed binary systems and try to get good selectivity and good activity. So you can see by looking at this uh, color plot for what leads to good activity for CO2 reduction, it focuses very much on the CO adsorption energy and how there's an optimal CO adsorption energy that leads to this red band uh, around uh, CO adsorption energy of about minus 0.67 EV. And you can see a couple of these uh, binary catalysts, copper aluminum appears in there, but some other do as well, copper indium and even uh, copper silicon. Uh, but then if you also look for selectivity, which is what the heat map on the right is showing, and you prioritize that simultaneously with the activity for CO2 reduction, you'll see that you would like to have a positive or even greater than zero uh, hydrogen adsorption energy to avoid the competing HER process. And so this does seem to point uh, towards a hint that exploring the aluminum copper space might be an interesting uh, area to explore. Now, it turns out that if you consider uh, all uh, 244 copper containing intermetallic crystals, but then you look at all the surfaces and you look at all the adsorption sites, you do have about 230,000 potential calculations on the adsorption sites to you to, to develop. And that is very computationally demanding, even with pretty good access to high performance computing, um, that was kind of beyond the scope of what we could do. And so working with Zach and his team, we looked at whether we could perform DFT just on a subset of these absorption sites. We ended up doing DFT, full DFT on about 4,000 sites, uh, but we used the data from those DFT to, to train up uh, an ML uh, algorithm in order to then, uh, we showed, we were able to accurately predict the behavior of the 230,000 adsorption sites. So about a 50X multiplier in acceleration relative to having done e everything with brute force DFT. Uh, and it was very much an automated uh, uh, learning framework uh, in that we actually cycled through the DFT, the ML regression, and then the prioritization as well uh, with the aid of the ML approach. So we were then able to really dig in and dive into these adsorption sites. You can see that if we zoom in on the copper aluminum region, we were able to kind of look at the chemical character of some of the best sites, the best sites that had the adsorption energy of around minus 0.67 EV. Um, you can see that that's kind of this mid purple color. And you can see that archetype number one is labeled with this various arrows uh, is showing a, a lot of near optimal adsorption energies. And that corresponds to these aluminum heavy copper sites. Uh, and you can see that we're too weakly bound, for example, in clusters four and five typically, which are too aluminum heavy. So it also enabled us to kind of coarsely estimate a good concentration range for the aluminum, which is in the five, 10, 15% range rather than the very, very aluminum heavy range. So that sent us into the lab. We went in to try to develop copper alloy uh, catalysts and actually found uh, quite good results on substantially planar copper alloy catalysts, which we made both by co-sputtering and also by ion implantation of aluminum into copper. Um, but then we actually found something pretty interesting, which is we could do even better if we uh, annealed the copper alloy, copper aluminum alloys, got a little bit of nanoscale phase segregation. So now there were aluminum rich regions and copper rich regions, did a selective edge, where we, you can see here, we're developing a kind of nanoporous material on the 10 or 20 nanometer length scale, selective edge because we're able to selectively remove the aluminum uh, and end up with a mostly copper catalyst with an aluminum rich surface and a lot of pores and therefore very high surface area. One of the concepts I was talking about earlier for where nano can really help us. 
And what we found was that relative to uh, pure copper or nanoporous copper, which has a Faraday efficiency of typically 60 to 65%, um, we were able to achieve at very high current densities, you see here we're at about 600 milliamps, which is getting close to that amp range you really wanna be in. <laughs> We're able to get to 75% on average and the occasional 80% Faraday efficiency uh, with these optimally designed uh, aluminum coated uh, copper uh, surfaces in these nanostructured systems. And so that's one story I wanted to talk a bit about is particularly focused on increasing selectivity. Um, getting to about 80% is interesting, although I'll admit that getting beyond that will be uh, a very important priority for the field. And I did want to move on to some work that we did uh, also this year towards increased activity. Um, so I had already made reference to the fact that the um, uh, activity of catalysts when we were just working in aqueous solution was really limited by the mass transport problem. Um, but it turns out that even when we get into this triple phase boundary business where we've got our gas reactants coming in from the gas phase, we've got our catalysts shown in brown, and then the optimal activity is right at this triple phase boundary, it still turns out that we do have some challenges left over. And I'm going to illustrate those here. So if we're sitting on a hydrophobic support shown by the gray, uh, and then there's some effectively meniscus with the aqueous electrolyte shown here, um, you know, right where the CO2 comes in from the gas phase, meets the aqueous solution, and then sees catalyst, we're in good shape. Um, but then as we try to penetrate further into the liquid electrolyte, uh, the CO2 will rapidly turn to carbonate, which comes with a number of problems. But one of them is, is CO2 availability right near the catalyst surface over here. And this can easily happen in some of the electrolytes we use after one or 200 nanometers. Uh, so it's a real problem, especially if you're trying to build a uh, a kind of nanostructured or bulkhead or junction catalyst. Um, so our thought was, could we add some kind of transport material shown here in the green? At the moment, it's, you know, it's kind of hypothetical. We'll tell you how we did it in a sec. Some kind of material that would kind of assist in the transport uh, of the CO2 gas and would do so very selectively right along the heterogeneous electrocatalyst surface. So we'd kind of have a, a transport medium that would wick our ingredients, our reagents, right along the desired boundary. Uh, and so the way in which we ended up doing that was using perfluorinated sulfonic acid ionomers. Um, so PFSA or Nathion is where we put our focus. Previously, uh, people working in the fuel cells industry had seen evidence that PFSA among various properties could uh, contribute to the transport of CO2 uh, along one of these interfaces uh, when it you know, covered the catalyst in the way I was describing. And so we pursued routes to kind of overcoat uh, the catalyst on its um, uh, non-conductive hydrophobic support uh, with this ionomer layer that could kind of cause the CO2 to wrap around and make contact with a greater fraction of the catalyst available. Uh, and relative to a copper control that did not benefit from the uh, CO2 transporting material. You can see here that we went from uh, about 100 milliamps or even a little bit less, all the way up to 0.6 amps uh, in these initial studies. And then when we really built out uh, a three-dimensional structure, you know, for those of you who work in organic PV, I think of this as a little bit like a bulk heterojunction where you're mixing together uh, the transport material, in this case, the CO2 transport material, and you're really intermixing it with, in our case, the catalyst, which of course also needs to be electrically conductive to get the re reduction capacity there, to get the electrons there. So it's really an admixture of copper uh, nanoparticles uh, and the PFSA. And so we went, when we did that, we were actually get, able to get well above one amp uh, per square centimeter of current density by optimizing the loading and the thickness of the layer. And we did it while keeping a good Faraday efficiency and therefore got to an interesting uh, energy efficiency through this approach. Now, <clears throat> I made reference a couple times to the fact that um, in highly alkali electrolytes, you do a lot of work uh, in KOH, for example, um, that there's a carbonate formation problem and it happens quite abruptly near the interface. Within a micron, you can be in trouble. 
And so for us and, and for many groups around the world in this field, there's an interest in moving towards neutral or potentially down the road to see if we can do acidic CO2RR. Um, so this next story is a story of trying to tackle the problem of working in neutral media, which allows you to move to a membrane electrode assembly architecture, where again, there's lots of learning from uh, both the fuel cell community and the water splitting electrolyzer community that can then be very helpful to us to advance the technology. Uh, and in this case, um, <clears throat> it's another collaboration that I wanna highlight uh, the key collaborators. This was with Teo Agape and with Jonas Peters uh, at Caltech. And we kind of posed to uh, those guys who are, who are brilliant, they're, they're experts in catalysis and in molecular design. We sort of posed this question, you know, how could we take what, what we like about working in alkali solutions, which is that CC coupling is very strongly promoted. And <clears throat> how could we seek to replicate that in uh, a neutral environment that would put us on the pathway to overcoming the carbonate problem, which is recognized as being something the field really has to do. Um, and so in conversation with Teo and Jonas and the colleagues, we started with a recognition that um, from computational studies, uh, the barrier to the desired uh, coupling process where you take two adsorbed carbon monoxide intermediates and you do the CC dimerization to produce uh, the C2 uh, product, such as ethylene that we were working on in this case, that the barrier to this is influenced by the binding motif <clears throat> of the CO intermediates. And that um, if you had two bridge bound or two a top bound uh, CO intermediates adsorbed on your copper catalyst, um, then in one case you had uh, just an unstable, this was an improbable thing to, to occur. And the other case you had a higher uh, barrier to the coupling reaction, <clears throat> but that if you could reach a point where you had managed the ratio of these two binding motifs on the copper to be approximately 50-50, it looked to us like you could uh, lower the barrier to the coupling reaction. Um, and so diving in a little bit further on that, we sort of asked the question, you know, could we think of molecular strategies that could be helpful? Uh, and here we started to, to reason that the bridge corresponds to uh, an electron back donation from the catalyst uh, related to the, the two pi uh, orbital. Uh, and that the atop uh, corresponds to the five sigma donation scheme. Uh, so where the bonding orbital of the CO donates to the surface. Um, and that if we could find ways to kind of manipulate uh, the ratio of these two configurations, that we would have something. Uh, and <clears throat> given Theo and Jonas's expertise in small molecule uh, design and synthesis, <clears throat> we sought to develop an approach where we could sort of adsorb some small molecules onto our catalyst, ideally a kind of library that we could explore systematically and to see if we could promote the bridge to top ratio or control the bridge to top ratio and could that correlate with improved CC coupling. Uh, and so uh, our Caltech friends prepared a library of n aryl pyridinium salts. And then we sought to tune the chemical environment by putting different electron donating accepting groups uh, to tune the electron density on the nitrogen. So that the nitrogen center, uh, which is in charge of the electron donation could be tuned. Uh, and our idea was that we might be able to tune uh, the, the atop bridge bound ratio that I was describing. So this is just the, the family molecules where I won't uh, go into the details, at least because it's not <clears throat> my deep expertise. Um, <clears throat> but I will say what the result was. So that family of molecules, there was 11 in the library. We were able to tune it. And then with the aid of Raman, we could look at the ratio of a top to bridge shown in the horizontal axis here. <clears throat> and then um, we calculated the beta charge shown uh, on the nitrogen, shown on the horizontal axis in the middle in the rightmost figure. And you'll see that by tuning uh, the designed beta charge, we were able to tune the atop to bridge uh, experimentally observed ratio from Raman. And then you'll see for those of you who work in this field, very much a volcano plot, but an experimental volcano plot where both by tuning the experimentally observed um, ratio of atop to bridge and correspondingly uh, the beta charge computed, uh, we were able to achieve an optimal Faraday efficiency, that's the vertical axis is the Fe, uh, to ethylene and uh, get it to about 72%, uh, whereas previous work in neutral electrolyte was limited to about 60% in the absence of this strategy. Uh, we then 
worked further to optimize the molecule and to make something a little more robust by through electrooligomerization, but using the optimal molecule that, that I described on the previous slide, which was molecule number one. Uh, and then as a result, we're able to keep the 72% Faraday efficiency in neutral media uh, and also achieve a pretty high current density, especially for neutral media conditions. Uh, and then achieve again a 200 hour runtime uh, preserving the Faraday efficiency, preserving about a 600 uh, milliamp current in this case uh, inside an MEA system. And so sort of summarizing where we got on the reductive side at this point uh, in, the, in the project, uh, I'll just say that for the, the past say five years or so, um, there had been reports typically measured in hours uh, of CO2 reduction to ethylene. Faraday efficiencies were in the kind of 30 to 60% range. And because people were working in H cells, <clears throat> the uh, mass transport limits of CO2 in, in water were limiting them to the tens of milliamps as shown in this column. Um, but you'll see these and of course other works contributed by the, the wider community, there's a lot of activity in this area now, have taken us into the hundreds of milliamps and even there were some uh, above that half amp. Uh, into the 70s and even up to uh, so far kind of hero 80% Faraday efficiency uh, and, and uh, reported durations now being measured in the 100 to 200 hours. And in fact, now typically most uh, CO2 reduction works are at least giving a one to 200 hour uh, operating time reasonably stably uh, to show that there's at least initial robustness on the path towards the tens of thousands of hours that are gonna be required. So I thought for my last story, and I'm cognizant of time and that we need to, we need to get to Q&A fairly soon. And in fact, I would like very much to get to the Q&A section. I'll be a little brief <clears throat> and just say that uh, on the other side of the reaction, you know, the moment by and large, we are producing oxygen on the anodic side. And we and many other groups are asking the question, could you produce something that you could sell also on the anodic side of the reaction? And ideally, could you actually reduce the overpotential uh, at the same time? Uh, and I'm just gonna see whether, uh, oh yeah, folks are being invited to put your questions in the chat and uh, uh, I agree, that'd be great. Um, and so on the, uh, on the anodic side, we and other groups have been trying to figure out, you know, what, what would be a valuable reaction to do? And I think you'll, you'll remember one of my early slides showing ethylene glycol. It's actually quite an interesting product from a market perspective. Uh, and also, if you look at it from a kind of energy in perspective, it's quite interesting. Uh, and actually from a CO2 perspective, there's a strong motive to think about things like ethylene glycol and ethylene oxide, because they do have quite significant carbon footprints at the moment. So for example, ethylene glycol through the existing uh, routes is a two-step process. It goes through the intermediate oxy rain, and it generates about 1.6 tons of CO2 per ton of ethylene glycol. Uh, and so we were very interested to explore whether we could develop a one-step electrochemical route. We would power it with renewable electricity, and we might also achieve some reductions in cost uh, related to you know, the, the two-step process and the purification that has to happen along the way. Uh, and so the researchers who did this, and uh, Yanwei Lum uh, and uh, Eric Wang are the first co first authors of this uh, study from earlier this year, uh, found initially computationally um, that when we uh, sought to explore how this reaction could proceed uh, on palladium, which is one of the catalysts in which it had been previously proven, um, that it, between uh, step four and step five shown in this reaction, um, was the uh, largest energetic barrier. So they focused on, again, a doping strategy, a kind of nanomaterials doping strategy, where they screened possible dopants like uh, silver and gold and cobalt and copper into the palladium. And they found that they were able to reduce this rate limiting process or rate limiting step uh, from theory uh, if they could dope in gold. Uh, and so they pursued the development of nanowires shown in the top left here that were both palladium and also palladium gold, and found that they could indeed improve the Faraday efficiency to ethylene glycol um, through this doped gold palladium uh, nanomaterial strategy. Now, you will also note that the current densities they were operating at were in the kind of five milliamp range, which is very far from the industrial range that we were interested in. 
And so we also recently asked the question, um, could we uh, produce electrocatalysis on the anodic side in some kind of systems approach uh, where we could get into the amp range? You know, what we found uh, in, in the previous work and, and in other attempts was that when we tried to go to, to higher potentials and higher current densities, that typically we really lost the selectivity, which is absolutely critical to these processes. Uh, and what we found in a very recent system study uh, is that we were able to use a, uh, an approach in order to get to epoxide, so ethylene oxide in this case, um, where we could overcome the very large carbon footprint that is seen in ethylene oxide production today through thermocatalytic routes, which really comes from uh, a lack of selectivity. So quite a bit of the ethylene that's being oxidized to ethylene oxide today ends up going uh, towards all the way to CO2. So you know, instead of being very selective and just taking it to ethylene oxide. Uh, and our concept here was that we would try to get to high current density um, by using a kind of um, a redox strategy or redox mediator approach. Um, and we thought that we could potentially then run at high current densities without over oxidizing. And essentially we build a kind of uh, delocalized or extended heterogeneous homogeneous interface and thereby also overcome mass transport limitations without having to go to such high potentials uh, that we were uh, producing uh, these kind of runaway processes where we couldn't control the oxidation and limit it just to the ethylene oxide. Um, so for reasons of time, I think I'll be a little brief on this and I'll just say um, that we were then able to uh, take this system and also couple it to a CO2 to ethylene system, go all the way from CO2 to ethylene oxide and it is also in that category like ethylene glycol that, can, uh, that commands quite a nice uh, market price. Uh, and so we were able to take uh, this uh, sector that had done some very nice catalysis that was very selective, but that was limited to the milliamps and take it out to the amp range using this uh, redox mediator and this kind of expanded uh, heterogeneous homogeneous uh, approach. And as a result, one of the things that does when you go to high productivities is it really reduces the burden of the capital cost. The cost is very significant at low currents, uh, but then it's shared over a higher productivity uh, when you go to high currents. So you can see it, it starts to get ethylene oxide to be at least forecast to get into the interesting techno-economic techno range. All right, so I do need to uh, wrap so we have enough time for questions, so I'll be Brief, maybe I'll skip our work on capture liquids, though I assure you it's cool. I'll just say that we're, um, we're working on scale up. Um, you know, I've explained that there's more work to do on efficiency and performance, but at the same time, scale is itself a challenge and we think it's very uh, interesting to work on. And so whereas in the lab, we've got a kind of Rubik's cube size electrolyzer, all the data that I talked about were from that. Uh, the team has scaled up by about five orders of magnitude to the 100 kilogram a day scale and are competing in the carbon X prize uh, right as we speak actually to uh, demonstrate that we can uh, at least achieve that degree of scale up, which is one important intermediate milestone along the way to industrial production. Um, I'll acknowledge that there's lots more work to be done, including at the systems level, including in working in these MEA systems. And uh, there's some fascinating science to be done uh, about understanding how these catalysts work and how to make them better. Uh, and there's some very practical applied targets that still need to be met. So there's lots left in this for grad students looking for interesting, challenging problems in material science. Uh, and those problems include increased energy efficiency, um, membrane work, work on stability, uh, and then really new systems entirely like acidic CO2RR. So just before Q&A, I would like to acknowledge the supporters of this work who have been uh, generous and have sustained in investing in us. And I'd like to acknowledge my group and in particular draw attention to four folks in the group who've been uh, instrumental in helping get the slides uh, that you saw put together today uh, assembled. Thank you, Ted. Thank you very much uh, for a fantastic talk. I'm sure we'll have plenty of questions. We're a few coming in. Um, we're going, and once again, remember that if you have access to mic and camera, please turn them on to ask questions. I think we have, hey, Rick Sullivan, go ahead, from Millipool. Yeah, hi, Ted, great talk. Um, 
so I was wondering is uh, for your approach um, using DFT and then machine learning, is this mainly applicable to bimetallic catalysts? And what is the benefits of this approach over looking at some uh, other exploratory methods, um, you know, like uh, high throughput screening methods that, you know, obviously uh, um, Northwestern is pursuing right now? Yeah, so I don't think it's limited to bimetallics. In fact, a little more on the OER side, we're now looking at three and four component uh, catalysts. And uh, when the chemical space just goes crazy like that, and you end up with uh, sort of you know billions and trillions of options, the benefits to having invested in developing the machine learned approach um, become even greater. I mean, they kind of scale up exponentially. So I think the bimetallic happened to be a large enough chemical space to make a point but the value proposition becomes even more compelling when you go to the tri and the quad. Uh, and then with respect to other high throughput methods, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, some of the ones that we're pursuing, of course, are experimental ones. There's ways in, including using high throughput robotics, high throughput electrochemical characterization, and high throughput materials characterization to generate experimental data in a more efficient fashion. And then, um, and this is an interesting challenge in its own right, to kind of unite computational and experimental data sets to learn off the union of the two. Um, so I think that's where things get really exciting, but I, I consider that to be very much a frontier area. Yeah, I, I think this is uh, very interesting. As a, one sort of follow-up question to tie in with uh, Jill's talk is how do we kind of look at these nanostructures and controlled atomic synthesis um, from the DFT perspective to actually creating these catalysis or catalysts? Yeah, no, it's a great question. It's quite, it's quite challenging to go, I mean, so it's one thing to sort of posit an artificially constructed catalyst with a single atom or with a little cluster on a surface, and then to sort of rationally go forward to the synthesis of exactly that catalyst. I'll just add other, one other reason why, why it's hard, although I know you're looking for me to tell you how, how to make it easy. Um, but one of the reasons why it's hard is that when we then operate under re reducing conditions, that's actually when we synthesize the catalyst. The, you know, the, the thing that we synthesize in the lab with our nanoparticles or our sputtering system, that's the pre-catalyst. And then we put this thing into its uh, electrolyte or onto its gas diffusion electrode and we apply a reducing uh, potential and we introduce some CO2, all of that is shaping the catalyst that emerges. So, the material synthesis process is multi-stage. And I would say that we don't have a complete rational understanding. Once we have an idealized catalyst that where, the, where our DFT colleagues say, this is what you wanna build, we actually don't have a kind of fully rational uh, approach to going building exactly that, especially operando. Um, having said that, we do have some brilliant synthetic people who are trying to think about, you know, how do we, uh, how do we try to predict what will emerge once we are under operando conditions? And we are very fortunate to have ever improving analytical capabilities operando. So we've been using X-ray absorption spectroscopy at, at every synchrotron we can, we can work with to learn about the oxidation state uh, of the various components. Um, obviously what gets really exciting is, is, is electrochemical electron microscopy. So TEM uh, operando, including elementally specific TEM operando. And we're working on that, but you know, you can imagine that's very much a frontier area as well. So it's one for collaboration with, with leading microscopists. Hey, Ted, this is Chad. First of all, I'm, I'm glad you are following through with our, our symposium tradition and enjoying a, a martini or what looks like a martini at the end of the talk. It's the, the privilege of the last speaker that's been so for, for many, many years. So enjoy, I wish we were able to enjoy one with you. Uh, the second uh, is a, a substantive question, or hopefully a substantive question. The question is that, you know, I look throughout your approach, and you've done this now for many years, uh, you're using a mixture of, of both molecular and materials-based approaches. Um, after all of this work, what is your sense of what's going to be the solution? Is it going to come out primarily from materials, which I think probably most would bet on, or do you think molecular systems have a chance to, to, to really make a difference. Yeah, you know, I'll just say when I was really enjoying Jill's talk, which was fantastic, I was reminding her she was talking about our ever deepening understanding of ligands and ligands as they pass at late surfaces and as they 
participate in the synthesis of nanomaterials, um, I know I, I came to sort of remind myself of how critical that approach has been to the enablement of uh, well-controlled nanomaterials with facet control, size control, shape control, um, uh, you know, vertex control. Uh, it's really been a fundamental enabling technology. And so I do actually consider to be the kind of unified uh, inorganic plus organic uh, approach to synthetic control, capping of surfaces, stabilization of surfaces. And then, you know, as I illustrated in some of our work with, with uh, Teo and Jonas, uh, for the manipulation of the adsorbates that are critical intermediates along the CO2 production path, um, I do think that it actually is a very, uh, it is a very important component. So I guess to summarize my answer to your question, Chad, I would not uh, say no to any degrees of freedom that allow us refined control and refined uh, understanding uh, over these really crucial uh, and complex surfaces that we need to manage in heterogeneous electric analysis. Thanks, Ted. Um, I had a question. I, I this reminded you made a comment early on about flu gas, uh, the flue gas being you said five, ten, or fifteen percent CO two seems like a big range. But the other part of it was, I was reminded of a conversation I had years ago with Cliff Kubiak talking about this problem of actually CO two concentrations being way too low coming out of even car exhaust. And you, I think you were going to start talking about capture. So I, I was going to maybe give you an opportunity to talk about that a little bit because it seems there's this pressure problem on the on the on the outlet, right? Yeah, absolutely. So there's there's a number of places where this <clears throat> requires more work. So in the flue gas capture, um, there the outlet is fairly concentrated already, but there's also other stuff in the mix. So SO2 is a classic example. And some of the stuff in the mix has the potential to poison R and other people's catalysts, um, or for that matter, some of the separation systems that are being used. So there's certainly work to improve the capture process, even there, the flues. Um, but there's also opportunities to study the mechanism of poisoning and to see whether we can make more robust catalysts that are less susceptible. So we could lower the requirements uh, on the purification of the outlet gases. Uh, and then to your point, Nathan, and to Cliff's point, uh, which obviously he's, he's a deep expert on, uh, as you go down in concentration, you increase the energy cost and you increase the dollar cost. Uh, associated with um, uh, producing the high concentrated CO2 streams. Um, there are groups that are working on that. There are groups that are working on air capture and trying to figure out how to get the price for air capture down from what many people estimate to be many hundreds of dollars per ton or even more and down to the one to $200 range. Um, and then one area that we work on in my group is to try to uh, actually directly process the CO2 not from the gas phase, but to process it from a capture liquid. So either from uh, carbonate capture solutions or from amine adducts of CO2. Um, but that's very much a kind of um, to be continued area. That's uh, an area of ongoing work. All right. Thank you very much. Sam. Hi, uh, Ted. This was a great uh, talk. Very inspiring. I, I just uh, wanted to uh, ask your uh, about your your perspective on how do how do you think we could move forward uh, on tandem reactions, right? Because that's that's another angle that I think is very important, and that you know rather than just always thinking about one transformation that is the key target, and and yes, you know, with if it's just one, two, or three molecules, it, I'm sure we can find the ways, uh, particularly integrating the inorganic particles with the organic molecules. But the tandem reaction pathway is, I think, extremely important as we look to the future, you know, where the, we can get to really more, slightly more complex molecules, whether they're fuels or they're precursors to materials, it doesn't matter. So what, what is your uh, perspective on that? Thanks, Sam. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful question and it's, and it's great to see you. Um, so, uh, I guess I sort of see two different schools of thought on the tandem reactions, both of which are interesting, and I don't think we've seen the, the field play itself out completely. So one is to create uh, multi-component surfaces that potentially can even have different catalysts, and where you can imagine a first uh, reduction reaction to this intermediate that can then migrate or diffuse towards another interface or onto another material. 
Um, that is cool, and that is the materials chemist's approach, and it, it certainly involves lots of exciting materials synthesis. I guess if there's a limitation to it in my head, it's that the electrochemical potential that's being applied to all of those components will be substantially the same, or at least they'll all be sort of referenced to each other. Um, some of my favorite work on the uh, independent potential control has been done by Joel Ager at uh, Berkeley and um, LL. Uh, DL. And um, uh, Joel, and this is actually some work that he did with uh, Ganway, who was the author of our ethylene glycol work. Um, uh, Joel has shown that, that they could uh, independently control the potential applied to different catalysts, kind of along a chain in a tandem reaction. Uh, and then they could hand off uh, a first kind of, for them, precursor that became an intermediate for the second reaction. And so they could achieve you know, much more freedom in the control over the system. And they just relied on putting the various catalysts uh, a distance away where uh, diffusion of those intermediates from catalyst one to catalyst two could occur. So it was very cool. Uh, it had the benefits that I just described. Uh, you know, is it the scalable approach? Is it the best approach? Probably that's to be determined. But it was a very nice demonstration of the concept that you could achieve independent potential control. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ted. Um, if, there's, if there's no more questions, we're, we're a little bit past the time. And uh, I'd, I'd like to thank you again, uh, Ted, for a fantastic talk and a, and a great way to finish today. Um, that leads me to uh, really thank all the speakers uh, for their presentations today. Uh, big thank you to Professors Jim Gates, uh, Bert Meyer, Jill Millstone, and of course, Ted. I'd also like to thank this year's sponsors, Argonne National Laboratory, uh, Execure, Glenn Research, Hitachi High Tech USA, and Millipore Sigma, Sigma for their support. Um, it's a really big thank you uh, to our IAN staff led by Kathy Cook for organizing this event. Um, we usually have this, of course, in, a, in a, a quite a large event at Northwestern. And as Chad said, we'd love to have uh, all the speakers here today uh, back in person. Um, and of course, for, for dinners and all the other things that go with events like this. And we've held this in person for many years and it's really a testament to the staff and the support we received from Northwestern that we're able to do this. Um, uh, most importantly, I'd like to thank all of you for attending. Um, wherever you're joining us from, uh, there are people all over the world and I think we got up above 400 people today at any one time. Uh, we really hope that you're safe, that you're uh, healthy and, and so, as with your loved ones. Uh, we're very glad you decided to uh, spend that time with us uh, today over the last few hours from the International Institute for Nanotechnology in Evanston, Northwestern. Uh, thank you all for joining us and we'll hopefully see you soon. Thank you.